similar direction. So the arrows are something that will be confusing, and there are many of them. And if you can learn from the beginning how they work and why they work, it's not so bad. But it can get overwhelming if you're not sure at the beginning. So we started off with asses and bases, and we said that's a very simple mechanism that you've seen before. And we can use two simple arrows, one to describe the movement of B towards the acid. Why is B going for H? Well, H typically is delta positive. And then to avoid breaking any of the rules, such as the octet rule, we have to lose two electrons, right? So that's a concerted process in which the bond is forming and the bond is breaking at the same time to give us products. And we started developing language on the reaction profiles about starter materials, reactants, products, intermediates, transition states, stuff like that. Uh, we defined what a nucleophile was. They like positive things. An electrophile likes negative things. And they're obviously going to go after each other. Uh, what I want to point out on this very simple example before we dive into today is that look what's happening here. The lone pair on the B is becoming a bond pair in the product. And the bond pair in HA is becoming a lone pair in that product. Now, the motivation for a lot of these reactions will to be to get to maybe a stronger bond or a more stable species like this. So when we discuss leaving groups and things being replaced, you're looking to go from something less stable over here, more reactive, and something more stable over there. I'll finish six very quickly here, get into seven, and we'll start seeing some real reactions. So these arrows mean something, and they have to go in the correct direction, or else this is all a mess. There are four modes of arrow pushing that the author of our textbook defines, and I think it's a very nice job because it really does summarize everything up. In SI this week, Tyler's going to talk about uh, more complex examples that you won't see for a few months, but we can pull out each different type of arrow by doing this very simple organization. Nucleophilic attack is basically something electron-rich going after something electron-poor. You might need a second arrow depending upon what's available. In this case, you don't need a second arrow because that only has six. Therefore, that fills the octet when you get over here. But that is the attack of a nucleophile on an electrophile. Once you know those definitions, you can start to expand this into much more complicated mechanisms that you won't see for a while, but you should be able to, to put these uh, labels in here. So this will be a nucleophile. What do you think about that? Strong or weak nucleophile if it's neutral? Weak. OK, weak. But these things will react later on. We'll see why, because this is so reactive. And we'll see now that a lone pair is being donated, as it was in the last slide, to form a bond. And then that is pushing electrons onto the oxygen. And then we'll find later on that this comes back down and this kicks this out. So in that example here, what type of arrow is that? Leaving group breaking off. If you've been reading this, you can just now categorize these things quite easily. Don't get lost in this. Don't panic with this stuff. This is just showing you what you're going to see in the future. You might use it as a measure of where you are in the class. Can you handle these things? Does it uh, frighten you when you see these things? It shouldn't. We should be able to handle these things pretty easily. So nucleophilic attack is very important. Loss of a leaving group is super important starting today. And there will be instances where something like a bromine can break off from a molecule. Even though it gives something unstable, ultimately it's worth it because where we go is more stable. And we can see now the bromine is taking off. Why is it OK for bromine to accept the charge? It's electronegative. It's more electronegative than carbon. But what else about it? It's large, right? Those same rules from acid and bases still apply here. It's a large anion. It can spread the charge quite easily. And so this is a pretty good species. Even though it leaves this in a bit of a, a problem, that's a decent species over here. And this will get some help in the future when a nucleophile comes in. Uh, this type of thing, do not fret about this. Do not worry about this uh, until a lot later. This is second semester stuff. It is essentially showing you that you can apply this to quite complex systems and use the same simple four arrows to describe each of the bond forming and breaking ideas. In this case, proton transfer is nothing more simple than an acid, nothing more complicated than an acid base reaction. We can see here from way back, a uh, lone pair going after a proton. We get the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Super strong acid, so the right hand side should be favored. And we can see now the proton has gone from one molecule to the other. That's all it is a proton transfer. Again, we can make this more complicated. A large part of the second semester is dealing with carbonyl compounds to get towards biosynthesis. Uh, and you can see here, picking off that proton in this step, that's simply a proton transfer. Here, using a base, doing something related, taking off that proton there. And we'll see why this should be acidic in the near future, because it's got this carbonyl next door, and so it's resonant stabilized. But again, the arrows are very simple. It's not random. For some of you, it will be random, but it shouldn't be random. Uh, the idea of these things making sense. Now, I want to mention this again, because it's my favorite word on the planet. Hyperconjugation. What is hyperconjugation? No, 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 no. Alderman, what's hyperconjugation? Go on, tell me. Whoa. <laughs> I promise not to make fun of engineers again. Until next time. Well done. Uh, yes, this is the donation of electron density. What it means, basically, is a carbocation, which is missing a pair of electrons, can get some help from its neighbors. 
They can get some help by feeling the influence of neighbors. If you don't have those neighbors, you don't get this. So lesser substituted compounds, such as a primary or a methyl type group, don't have many neighbors or any at all. And so this doesn't work. But if you start to put branches on here and you make this into a secondary or tertiary carbocation, you've got quite a lot of help. And this is the sort of picture that we use. Don't forget that these bonds are equally close. We could, we could donate from any of those bonds. So the more neighboring bonds you have at what we call the beta position next door to the carbocation, the better, the more stabilized it will be. Okay, now the rearrangement was an exaggeration of that. Once you understand that, this is very, this is okay. Let's be careful here. None of these cations will be stable. You can't distill them, you can't crystallize them. They're going to react to do something else. Uh, this will be achievable, let's say. This is certainly achievable because it's tertiary and it has lots of help from its neighbors. If these are methyl groups, you'll have nine neighbors to help out. You go to secondary, fewer, not as stable. Primary, fewer again, not as stable. This one, lousy. There are no neighbors, okay? So these primary cations, these methyl cations won't form. So once we recognize that, uh, we said on Friday that a carbocation of a secondary nature wants to become tertiary because it's going to be more stable that way. What we'll get here is the four type of arrow, rearrangements, in which we can have an atom jump across. And that atom basically migrates and shifts across to this carbon and leaves the positive charge there. You have gone from secondary to tertiary. You won't go backwards. It's logical. You're going downhill. You're becoming more stable by doing this. And I think I mentioned on Friday, why is this a fast reaction? It's a fast reaction. Why is that? It's intramolecular, good word, okay? Everything's already there. There's no reorganization necessary. There's no other molecule to come along and find this thing. Everything's already in the, in the same molecule. And so an intramolecular process like this ought to be fast. And does that correspond to a high activation barrier or low? Low activation barrier, all right? And again, today we'll start putting all these things together to see more complex examples and, and schemes. In the last example, it was a hydrogen that moved over. In this example, there is no hydrogen. There's a methyl, and it can move as well. You can get carbon migrations. You can get hydride migrations. So don't forget, this is not breaking off, it is sliding along, and we are attaching it now at this position to leave the positive charge here. And I always thought of sort of positive charges as holes, right? You've dug a hole, this is a hole, so you're filling it, and you're leaving the hole there. Go ahead. It's got nothing to do with the size of the group. Right? It's not to do with the size of the group, it's the availability of the group. Now we will see later on that certain groups migrate faster than others, but that's next semester. Okay, but right now, if there's a group next door, a carbon or a hydrogen, and moving benefits the system, it will do so. And again, it's just experience and practice as you start seeing more examples. Okay? Ashley. Proton transfers are very fast as an intermolecular reaction, right? But this will be faster because it's intramolecular. And we will, but we will sort of uh, talk about those different activation barriers as we go. All right? Uh, so with that in mind, we can start looking at more complex systems, for example, here from 7, which we'll start in a minute. Uh, this is a mechanism that you'll see pretty quickly here. This is an SN1 mechanism in which we get an acid-base reaction in the first step, and that sets up a good leaving group. The idea now is that OH is not a good leaving group, because when it breaks off, it's hydroxide. That's unstable. If you protonate it beforehand, it breaks off as water. That's very stable. So that's a good process. It leaves a carbocation, which could benefit from migration, and in by the end of the week you'll know this mechanism, you'll learn it and you'll understand it, you go to a tertiary system and then we get the nucleophile coming in to finish this off and we end up with the product that then is isolated. So this is the system where you're replacing OH with BR and we'll call it a substitution reaction. We'll also see the second type. There are two types that you'll need to deal with in seven. This is the bimolecular process, right? This one here is going to be said to be unimolecular. The slowest step only involves one molecule. That comes today uh, or Wednesday. And this one is both need to be there in the transition state for the, the slowest step. So in this case, this is concerted, and this has got multiple steps, so it's stepwise. They were definitions we dealt with. But look at the arrows. Two came in and two came out. So you can start to put these things in quite easily. Uh, and you'll certainly see this next week on an exam. There'll be a question on there that says what type of arrows are being employed in this mechanism. Even if you haven't seen the mechanism before, you should be able to do it. Uh, from next semester, again, straightforward. Decide that it's a nucleophile attacking something. Uh, there's not a proton transfer here, That's all, you know, there's not a leaving group breaking off. Here there's a leaving group breaking off when something leaves, and there's an acid-base reaction. There are 120, I forget the exact number, 124, 125 mechanisms that you have to know by the end of next semester. They all will break down into these basic ideas. Learn it now, it's much easier to get later on. Go on. Uh, you, you, you can memorize this stuff at your peril and, and endanger your health. 
Okay, and again, this is the, what you know. The main reason I didn't go into biology and went into chemistry was I didn't like memorizing. I like logic. I like solving problems through logic. And you'll find out if you learn the basics now, you'll be able to look at a product in a new mechanism and hopefully think, well, I think it's going to go in this pathway before you even see the mechanism. It would be nice, and I think this works for the, the higher level organic classes, from this class you should be able to predict. Yeah? So memorization will only get you so far. Understanding it will get you much further. Yeah, and it won't be as painful. So we need to be precise. This is, you know, I'm taking my time with this because it is key. It is, the, it is from now on what causes C's to become D's and things like that. We don't want that. In this example, I have a nuclear file. You'll learn how to identify that pretty quickly. It's an unstable species that wants to share its charge to become stable by being neutral. I'm attacking this carbon. Why am I attacking that carbon? Why not the one next to it? Delta positive, right? As you're doing the homework, and I'm seeing some people make mistakes here, you're looking for delta positive centers. Negative things will attack delta positive just like they did for acids and bases. You're not going to attack some random carbon which isn't positive, right? That just does not happen. So I have two arrows here, be precise. We're starting at the lone pair if we can. We're heading to the electrophile and the second arrow here. Why does that have to be there? You'd be breaking the octet rule otherwise. We don't want to do that either. We can see here, again, the definitions that I talked about when I first started today. That lone pair on the auction is becoming a bond pair. You're swapping one for the other. And this bond pair here is becoming a lone pair. Now I'm gonna mention this Again, this, this is an important type of system. Why do you think the right-hand side is, is favored here? Any ideas? Looking at that system, what do you see? You have O minus here, you have a neutral molecule there, you have a neutral molecule there, you have Cl minus there. Why do you think the right-hand side should be favored here? Say again? Chlorine is larger than oxygen, which means what? It's better at handling a negative charge. So much of what we'll do here is based on that. Where do you want your negative charge to be? You know this is a very powerful reagent. You know it's a very powerful base, and now it's going to be a powerful nucleophile. It wants to share its charge and become neutral. If you can get rid of that charge from here and put it on chlorine, that ought to be a good thing. And if you measure the bond energies of this molecule versus this molecule, they're not that far apart. They will be different, but they won't be that far apart. So it's got to do something now with the anions. Where do you want the charge? You want it on something that's better at handling it. So what, what takes precedent? What, what's even better than having a large anion? Resonance, right? So resonance will play a role in leaving groups as we develop then. Now, to finish off, they have to be logical. You can't break the octet rule. Please don't. Uh, make, this should make sense. And if it isn't making any sense, come and ask. Because the rest of this class and next semester is all about these arrows, whether you like it or not. Right, they must be logical. Don't be making carbocations that are less stable than where you start. That should make some sense by now. And think about what can go. We will do a lot of this in seven and eight. You'll see different systems in which maybe a cycle opens up or, or expands. You'll see alkyl groups migrate, you'll see hydrogens migrate, but it's the same logical process. Go to something more stable. There is a question now about reversibility. We need to be comfortable with why some systems go backwards and why some don't. You think about acids and bases, it was all based on PKAs, acid strengths and base strengths. Why did some systems go all the way to the right? Well, it's because that right was so much more stable based on those thermodynamic numbers. Uh, we will see in the second term that this type of acid-base reaction on an alpha carbon next to a carbonyl is in fact reversible if you choose to use that base. And it turns out here the pKa is about 19. What's the pKa of the conjugate acid of that? ROH is 16, isn't it? ROH is 16. So does it make sense that that's reversible? This is about, you know, this is 16, this is 19, they're not that far apart. You would think that would go backwards and forwards. And when we do the next reaction, which we'll see later, uh, this is being a nucleophile that's doing a nucleophilic attack with a leaving group breaking off, and that produces this. And it turns out that's not going backwards. That's not going backwards because this is way more stable than what you would make if you went backwards. This thing here is quite unstable. That's very stable. So this idea of reversibility is logical. If you understand the basics of what we developed in the first four weeks, again, I said the first four weeks are really critical here. Understand that stuff. This isn't so bad. So mostly next term, we spend a huge amount of time worrying about these little, little details. Is the arrow reversible? Is it not? We will do this in chapter eight when we do the alkene synthesis. You'll do this in the lab, and we'll bring in what you do in lab. What experiments are we up to so far? You just did distillation, so I think maybe you do TLC next, and then you start doing real experiments. And that's nice because by that time, I'll be talking about that chemistry in class. And we can start wondering why we're doing with that. Instead of just plugging things together and you know, going through the motions, you'll decide, oh, we have sleep at the back. Oh, no, Santa Gantas forgotten his coffee. Give him a knock. 
I will keep you awake. Um, we will see that lab becomes important because it's where all the, all the data came from to come up with these ideas. Um, so don't sweat too much about this. Just recognize that we're going to build on this. It's not important that you see exactly now why something is reversible, why something isn't. That's what we need to do. That's the detail we need to fill in. So just summarizing chapter six very quickly here. Uh, you need to be happy with these pictures. We will see a lot of them now in seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way through chapter 27, which is where I get to. Uh, we need to worry about the definitions so I can use the language. The starter materials are the things you get in the lab from the hood or from the, the, the side there, and you measure out and you put into a reaction flask. Reagents, things like sulfuric acid, things like HBr, maybe they're not organic materials, but they're necessary to make a reaction go. Uh, we need to worry about where these things are in the profile. Okay, starter materials over here, uh, products over there. Reagents might be something like HCl. It might be something like NaCl. We'll see that as we go. Uh, reaction rate, the rate of the reaction is dictated by the height of the highest barrier. In chapter 7, we'll define the rate determining step in more detail. The rate determining step is always the slowest step. Right? It's always the slowest step of any of the number of steps in a reaction. That comes again in a minute. Uh, that activation barrier can be high or low, depending upon what's happening. It would be nice if we understood that. Uh, why is acid-base chemistry so fast? Well, a proton is very accessible. There's nothing around it to get in its way, so a base can attach to it quite easily and quite quickly. Uh, the transition states, we've got a lot of detail here coming up. And again, the way I try to teach it and have you learn it is you should be able to look at a reaction you haven't seen before and then be able to draw me a transition state and put all the detail in, put the charges in. Uh, this is a concerted process, is that okay? The idea that everything's happening at once. How do I know it's concerted? There's only one step. It can't be stepwise, there's only one step, right? So everything's happening at once. Uh, the products on the right-hand side are gonna be more stable, you would hope. And if they're not more stable, we have to engineer something to make it work. We'll see that a lot in chapter eight. Then the question will be, is it reversible? As we head into this 120 different reactions, you'll start to wonder about, is it reversible or not? And I hope it will start to make some sense. And if we understand a little bit about acid and bases from the first couple of weeks, this shouldn't be so bad when we talk about equilibria. We did mention kinetic products versus thermodynamic products. A lot more to come on that. Typically, you're looking for either the faster form product or you're looking for the more stable product. And that will lead into something called major and minor. When you've got two or three or four products formed, which one do you get the most of? Those, those ideas come from these pictures. So the other one was the, um, to summarize six, the other one was a stepwise pathway. How do you know it's stepwise? There are two hills. Some of the reaction profiles you'll see will have 10, 12, 13 hills, and it's the same sort of idea. Look for the highest one to be the, um, the rate determining step. In this case, it's stepwise because I have two of these reaction barriers. Which one do you think is slower, the first step or the second step? The first step, because we're going from here to here, that's higher. We will call that in the near future the rate determining step, okay? And that will be something, for example, like the formation of an intermediate. Thinking about the quiz, thinking about the homework, an intermediate is real, you can measure it, you can see it, but you can't isolate it. It doesn't live long enough. So it's like a transient species on the way to a product. And then we'll find that the intermediates will go undergo reaction, for example, here. Uh, if I just finish this off, what type of arrow is that? Leaving group breaking off. And then CL minus comes in and helps, what type of reaction arrow is that? That's exactly it, and that's where we go in chapter seven. So the rate determining step will mean something very, very soon. The, st the reactions in the next chapter, I think the most steps we have is three, so it's not too bad, and we lead into it gently, um, and hopefully it sticks, sticks and sinks in. Anybody want to say anything about chapter six apart from goodbye? Did we like chapter six? Is anybody in chapter six? Holderman is, because he knows the definition of hyperconjugation. Or he's just scared and he made sure he learned it. Anybody else? Did the soccer team, the soccer team, are you okay? You keep losing. Why do you keep losing? It's a struggle. Okay. I'm going to talk about chapter 7, if I can find it. Chapter 7 is detail. And as I will show you pretty quickly here, these are mechanisms that are really important in, for example, medicine, pharmacy, biology, engineering. These are chemical reactions that you need to be comfortable with so that we can start talking about bigger systems. I teach a class in the spring. You took it, right, Tyler? Same sort of stuff, arrow pushing, deciding about what's going to happen in a system based on biological molecules. But it was all mechanistic. It was all the same idea. So we need to understand these things now so that we can get there. In chapter seven, it's all about something called a substitution. And a substitution is replacing one thing for another, swapping out something for something else. And the something will be a nucleophile, and the something else will be a leaving group, swapping one for the other. 
and we'll see that the structure of the compound makes a big difference. It needs to be a certain structure for this to work, and it needs to be, uh, you know, this is going to depend upon understanding what's a primary system, what's a tertiary system, stuff like that. So I take my time with seven. I've got about 70 slides in seven. I'll probably get through it before the exam and make a little bit of eight uh, available, available for the test, but we're not going to rush this. This needs to be good and it needs to be understood, so what comes next is understood. Now, is it fair to say that I am replacing x with y? Yeah? That's all that's happening there. It is not as simple as it looks. There will be several different ways of doing this, several potential ways of doing this. When we define the mechanism, how does that work? Because if you think about this, what has to happen to x in this system? It has to leave. Let's use that terminology, right? It has to leave at some point. And if that has to leave, what do you think y was in the reaction? A nucleophile. Now, we'll define very quickly how this happens, why it happens. So that's all that substitution reaction is. And there's an example of it. This is maybe the first real chemical reaction we thought about since acids and bases. And this is the beginning of the, of the rest of the material. Uh, I have an electrophile. How do I know it's an electrophile? It has a delta positive carbon because the chlorine is more electronegative than it. So I've got this delta positive situation. I have a nucleophile, something like SH. Don't forget that you should put lone pairs in, as we've learned the acids and bases, because now they're important. And I can take one of those, and we'll see that this reaction involves attacking that carbon and kicking out that leaving group. By Wednesday, you'll be able to look at any of these systems and decide which is going to happen. Am I going to go in one pathway this way, or am I going to go in this pathway? Okay, Two defined pathways. So a substitution process, usually at the beginning, relies upon alkyl halides. And alkyl halides, I will do this. Okay. Alkyl halides are really, really important substrates, but the problem is nature doesn't produce them. Okay. These are one of these materials that we've had to develop in the lab to help us do what we do. Uh, they are really, really useful, and much of their chemistry is based upon this idea, this dipole idea where we have this a shift in electron density based on one atom being more electronegative than the other. And we'll see that you know, fluorine is the most polarized, and then it dies off a bit, but it will make sense here. Which do you think is the best leaving group, I minus or F minus? F, well, where do you want to put a negative charge? On F minus or I minus? I minus, right? F, F is small, doesn't want that negative charge. Think about the pKa's of the acids. pKa of HI is about negative 10. pKa of HF is plus 3. So I minus is way more stable. But they all have the same characteristic here. They all have this polarized bond, and so we ought to be able to go after that and kick one of these atoms out and do a substitution process. So our substrates at the beginning of this chapter for the substitution reactions will be alkyl halides. This is a very good leaving group. It's such a good leaving group that under the right circumstances, you can leave carbon with just six electrons. This thing can break off, and this thing can be formed. Now, why do you think carbon is OK with a positive charge? If you put a positive charge on an O, let's say you took a pair of electrons away from an O, or you took a pair of electrons away from a Cl, why is that totally nonsense? They're so electronegative. What about carbon? What's its electronegativity? 2.5, right? It's right in the middle. Yeah, it's right in the middle. So it's going to be able to do a lot of different things that the other at atoms can't do because of its intermediate electronegativity. So in this example, we will be able to take this off. And look what that, that CL is behaving as a leaving group. So what we'll do today is just put together the machinery for the first type of mechanism and then start talking about when it happens. Before that, go on the website, look at the little tutorial thing for nomenclature. I'm going to spend five minutes on this because it's dry and you can learn it yourselves. What we did previously for alkanes to name them was look for longest chain. Let's do the same thing. Okay? Then we'll look at the substituents. Then we'll look at numbers. And then we'll put it all together alphabetically. It's the same process you learned for alkanes applied to alkyl halides. But because we have extra bits and pieces now, like fluorines and iodines and whatever, we can do more interesting problems. We can do R and S on these things and build more realistic compounds. So very simply here, on the left, longest chain is three, propane. The chlorine is at carbon two. Let's call it two chloropropane. If you were to move the chlorine to the end, it would be one chloropropane. Same idea. And I would like to stamp out some of the spelling issues that we get here. It is chloro. It always has been and it always will be. It's not chlori, chlora, chloroth. It's chloro. And then it's bromo and iodo. Right? So let's learn the language properly. On the right-hand side, I've got a chain now, which is five carbons long. That's where the pentane came from. I've got two substituents now, one of which happens to be a bromo, and the other one happens to be a methyl. So why is the bromo before the methyl? It's alphabetized. We are going to develop fairly quickly here a prioritization scheme, a hierarchy for these substituents. But I, I can say this pretty quickly. Halides and alkyl groups have the same rank. 
right? They're all privates. That's all they are. When you get to the alcohols, they're more like captains or majors, right? They're really important. They're in charge. But the, the ones here, the bromos and the iodos and what have you, are the same rank as methyls. So when you have those on a molecule, just don't alphatize it. There's nothing more important than the other. Well, again, we've got to be careful with numbers. This is just a refresher, a review, if you like. Uh, in this example, we've got the possibility of a 255 versus a 336. So we keep the number small, and the 2 beats the 3. That's how we number these things to keep it sensible. Uh, you'll recognize now, you can number from left to right. You can number from top to bottom or right to left. But it's getting you the smallest numbers and the longest chain. Same idea. Okay. In this example, we have R to 5 bromo 233 trimethyl heptane. These names are much more fun, right, than just simple alkanes. They are much more fun. So in this example, I've got an R stereocenter denoted by this thing here. Yeah, we've been practicing these things for a while, but now you can name it completely. And just a heads up for next week, I'll ask you this in two different directions. I'll give you a name, you draw me the molecule. I'll give you a picture of a molecule, you give me the name. So we need to be able to do this thoroughly. The R in this case, what's number one on the stereocenter? Bromo. What's number two? Left or right? Left and three. And it's what? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Right? Now, you see how straightforward this is now? A week later when we did this, and it was the first day, like, what's going on here? Everybody can do this because they've been practicing. Again, you know, we blame the pharmacist for everything because it's usually their fault. And this comes about because of the development of chemistry across the planet. And people came up with different ideas to name the same thing. So you'll get frustrated as you get further in because you have common names and you have systematic names. All right? Systematic names are probably more thorough, but the common names are there. The chemistry seminar we had on Friday in, in the department over there, it was a guy coming back from a, a, a big chemical company, and his job is to liaise with uh, the public and, and customers about what they want. They want a chemical mixture to do some, some testing or some sensing. And they give him a list of common names. Right? If you don't know what the common name is, you don't know what it is. But if you get the systematic name, it's easy because it's systematic. So in this example for the halogens, we've got two ways of writing it. We've got something called a substitutive name and something called a functional class name. All it is is simply this. In one of them, the halide is a substituent on the alkane. In the other one, the alkane is a substituent on the halide. You see? All you've done is this. Switch them like that. So in the first one here, the halogen is a substituent on the alkane. That's the systematic name. That's what we call a substitutive name. That's the, probably the easiest one to do, because then when you have multiple substituents, you just call it chloro as part of a bigger name. On the right-hand side, on a very simple molecule, this will also be called ethyl chloride. They're both the same molecule, but have different names. On the right-hand side, the chloride now is the parent, if you like, and the ethyl group is the substituent. You will have a much easier time on the left, because that helps you big, build bigger molecules. On the right, for simple, very sort of, you know, not complicated systems, we can use that. But the one on the left is, is probably the, the best one to go with. In terms of uses out there, in terms of uh, where do these things show, I said they don't show much in nature. There aren't many alkyl halides in nature. There are some in, in some weird sort of sponges that people find in, in sort of uh, Pacific reefs and things like that. But for the most part, we have to put them in. We have to install them. And alkyl halides are very useful. What's the most common alkyl halide that you're aware of? I can think of two that everybody should know about. What's well, on your frying pan? Does anybody go in the kitchen these days, or is it all McDonald's? What's well, on the frying pan? What's the coating on the frying pan? Teflon. That's an alkyl halide. Right. We'll see that a little bit later. The other one is on your house, right? Vinyl siding is an alkyl halide. And those are produced in large quantities. And because they're not natural compounds, they're difficult to get rid of. Right? But you can make medicines out of these. We can think about this as an antimicrobial reagent with the bromine in there. Uh, this one is an antihistamine with the chlorine. And this one is an antidepressant with trifluoro. We can put these in quite easily. They just don't exist in nature. So this is something we've had to develop. Other names, thinking about just getting out of this quickly. Uh, the functional class, this would be a chloride. This would be a bromide. This would be an iodide. And then it's up to you to do the same thing you did previously and come up with the prefix, come up with the name of this based on uh, what alkyl groups are attached there. I don't think anybody will have any problems with those. And then the one down here, this is just more useful to me because the molecules get bigger and you can't call it an alkyl halide because it isn't. It's an alcohol or it's something else. It's a benzene derivative. So we have now the bromo is to show where it is. The two needs to be there because you can have isomers. 
and the three here in the middle because we have uh, iodo at three and again over here make it more complicated put alpha of the ties and number them sensibly just the same way we have anybody got any questions on that that should be pretty straightforward i think don't forget r and s gets more interesting now because we have all of these things here well welcome to alkyl halides you're about to see a lot of them we need some geography we are going to call the carbon with the functional group attached, the alpha carbon. That will be the same all the way through the two semesters and into biochemistry. The carbon with the functional group attached is the alpha carbon. And so if we just uh, label this sensibly, that's a beta carbon, that's a beta carbon, that's a gamma, etc. down the chain. It's the alpha carbon that's delta plus. In chapter 7, it's all about the alpha carbon. In chapter 8, it's all about the alpha and the beta. So we're starting simple and we'll expand out. That's a definition that we should be you're okay with. We did this a little bit when we did the carbocations. It's the same rule. We need to categorize these things. How do I know this is a primary alkyl halide? Well, if I just take my time here and put my hydrogens back in, it has two hydrogens and only one carbon attached. So this R group is a carbon piece. So if I have one carbon attached to my alpha position, that's a primary alkyl halide, just like a primary carbocation was. If you learned that primary stuff over the weekend, it's the same idea. Here I have two carbons attached directly to my alpha carbon, only one hydrogen, that makes it secondary, and I have over here three, no hydrogens, that makes it tertiary. How important is that categorization? It's everything in chapter seven. When you are making decisions about which pathway to go down, it's all about whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary. So make sure we're okay with, with that. On the left, what type is this? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary, what about this one here? What does that mean in English? Secondary. What about over here? Tertiary. You need to do it that quickly because that's the very end. That's the entry into the problem. You need to see what type of system it is so you can decide what to do with it. Are we ready? Are we awake? Jadu, you got some coffee today? You feeling good? Okay. Santa Gantas, we okay? Ready to go? Oh yeah, this will keep you awake for days on end. Here are the arrows that we have developed in chapter 6. And we're going to apply them now to substitution reactions in chapter 7. We will be doing nucleophilic attacks. Oh, yes, we will, and lots of them. We'll have leaving groups disappearing left and right. Goodbye. We will have proton transfers sometimes to make it more interesting, but also more useful. And we will have rearrangements because they're cool. We'll use them all. It's going to be great. It's going to be huge, as they say. There are several ways you can think about one group substituting another. I can have a concerted mechanism, right? This slide is a summary of what can happen in these reactions and what can't happen in these reactions. I'm saying that I'm substituting something for something else. That's what's happened right there. I have swapped my leaving group for my nucleophile. They've just, they've just changed roles. One was negative to start with, the other one is negative to start with. One was neutral and had a bond, the other one, the same thing. So I'm making this bond and I'm breaking this bond. That's what has to happen. And as we develop more complicated mechanisms, that's what you do, is you write down a list of what you need to get done. And when I teach the recitation, I've already set up, well, uh, next semester I have an extra recitation for the engineers who can't make it to my normal ones. We had added an extra one, so everybody needs to be in recitation next semester because we just don't have uh, time for all the nitty-gritty detail here. I'm going to say that it's all about breaking bonds and it's all about making bonds. That's what I have to get done in this process. In this particular mechanism that is being suggested, you know, this is conjecture just at the moment, how about, in order to replace my leaving group, my nucleophile comes in and boots out the leaving group, just kicks it out. The bond is formed at the same time that the bond is broken. That's a concerted process, right? And you will see that that's a very common system. That happens. That's one way that this could happen. And I'll say this for the first time, I think. The mechanisms will differ by the timing of events. When does what happen? In this system, everything happens at once. Well, you can imagine it happening in a different way, a different sequence. How about, instead of the nucleophile coming in first and kicking out the leaving group, how about the leaving group takes off? This will happen when the nucleophile isn't very strong, right? It allows things to happen. Other things happen, and then the nucleophile gets involved. Because if I break this bond first, I can form a carbocation. And depending upon my understanding of hyperconjugation, that will be a good cation or a bad cation. If it's a good one, we can do this. And in the second step, 
a nuclear file comes in and it's done the same thing. It's replaced the leaving group, but this time it's done it in a different sequence of events, simply breaking off and then attaching as opposed to everything going at once. Now, there could potentially be a third one. How about the nuclear file sticks and then the leaving group breaks off? Why don't we like that? People are shaking their heads. Why don't we like that? Break the octet rule. Absolutely, you're breaking the octet rule. So you can't do this. You can't stick the nuclear file on and then the leaving group breaks off because you haven't got the, you know, it's, it's unstable to do that. So this won't work. This certainly will. And this certainly will. In that top reaction, how many steps going from here to here? One. How many steps here? Two. Okay. In the first step, the nuclear file and the leaving group have to both be there. So what's the molecularity? Is it unimolecular or bimolecular? Bimolecular. They both have to be there in what we'll call the rate determining step. In this example down here, I haven't seen the graph yet. I'll put the graph up in a minute. Which do you think is slower? This leaving group breaking off or this nuclear file coming in? Leaving group breaking off because you're going somewhere stable. That's going to be an endothermic step. And we'll see for reasons that are fairly obvious that this reaction here is quite fast. This is flat. This is nucleophilic. They'll go after each other quite quickly. So we'll develop very quickly now pictures and conditions that allow these things to happen. First off, you will never, ever, ever forget this. This kind of stuff sticks with you forever. Something called a bimolecular substitution. Guess which one it is? It's the top one, right? Where everything's there at the same time. Bimolecular. SN2, we need to understand what the, well, the S is obviously substitution. N is because it's a nucleophile. And the 2 is because it's bimolecular. And that molecularity now becomes an issue when deciding what's going to happen. So in this case, it turns out, if you do a simple system like a primary or a methyl alkyl halide, it turns out that the rate of reaction is dependent on the alkyl halide and the nucleophile concentration. So if I add more nucleophile, what happens? Faster or slower or the same? Faster. If I add more substrate, faster or slower or the same? Faster. Simply because there are more of these things to find each other, right? If you've got one mole of substrate and 10 moles of nucleophile, you're going to get a faster reaction because there are more of them. There are more chances of those nucleophiles hitting those substrates. That's all it is. So in terms of where the names come from, it's fairly simple. Substitution. Nucleophilic, bimolecular. When you see the picture of this, the reaction profile, you'll see exactly why it's bimolecular. And so now we can start thinking about real chemistry, real mechanisms. This is the first one. We're going to see nucleophiles go after substrates. We're going to have something here that's capable of taking a charge, something that's a good leaving group. And we're going to swap the nucleophile to the leaving group. And we're going to deposit the charge onto something that's better at handling it. So we'll need to define what's a good leaving group, what's a good nucleophile, and what's a good substrate. All of these different ideas will come into play now. Why is it important in biology? Well, if you want to alkylate anything, for example, you want to take norepinephrine and you want to turn it into epinephrine, which is adrenaline, which more, you probably know more about than I do for the biology people, you've got to alkylate it. You've got to do an SN2 reaction on something and you've got to behave, you know, do the same thing we would in the lab. Is this the nucleophile or the electrophile? Right, it's a nucleophile. Why is it a nucleophile? It's got a lone pair. And it turns out over here we have a methyl group. So mechanistically, and you will see this from me, take a bigger molecule like that. It looks different. It's not. It's the same idea. And I'm going to attack this over here. And I'm going to kick this out. So what's the sulfur behaving as? A leaving group, right? Now, just to give you a heads up, I'm a chemist. That's, that's it for me, I think, pretty much. That's about as complicated as it needs to be. If you're a biologist, there's your equivalent of I minus. Yeah? It's way more complicated. And it has to be for specificity, or else everything would just go crazy. So as we develop these simple ideas, and I've tried to relate them to biology and, and pharmacy and stuff like that, you're going into much bigger worlds. At the end, I end up with this, which is alkylated. There's my product, and there's my leaving group. It's now neutral. That's why it's stable. So these SN2 processes are fundamental to biological processes. So here's our generic mechanism. I'm going to say that some nucleophilic thing attacks my R group. So that R group has to have certain properties. It can't be too crowded, or else it'll be too slow. It's usually uncrowded. And I'm going to kick out something that's capable of handling a charge. Completely related to acids and bases, where I minus is good, BR minus is good, F minus isn't so good. And I end up with a substitution product on the right-hand side. That's it. That's the SN2 mechanism. That's the generic example. The problem with this is picking up all the details. 
but trying to do it in a sort of an organized sense. This is my nuclear file. This is my electrophile. You couldn't get those wrong. Okay? The electrophile is the one with the leaving group attached. The nuclear file is the negative thing. I'm going to start over here where I have lone pairs. I'm going to go here to carbon, and I'm going to go there. That is the SN2 mechanism. We'll see where the two comes from, where the experiments show you it's bimolecular, but that's all there is to it. One arrow in, one arrow out. What does it look like? What does it remind you of? It's an acid-base reaction, yeah? It's an acid-base reaction because this is a Lewis base, this is a Lewis acid. And that's just an acid-base reaction. But we'll call it substitution to keep it more organic and keep it, keep it organized. Let's think logically. What's the driving force for this? Why should it want to happen? Yes, maybe this bond is weaker than this bond. Okay, but not by much. Where would you rather have charge? Localized on O minus or localized on Br minus? Because it's bigger. That's why it works. Yeah, that's why it goes. You'll need to worry about examples. You'll do this in the lab in a few weeks. Uh, we can see now we'll have to worry about details such as solvents because you can't jump into an empty swimming pool. You need to have some medium in there to swim around in. Solvent. And we'll see now that leaving groups, salts, are, make, are usually good nucleophiles. And we'll swap one for the other, and we'll get a product. Okay. So there's a lot of detail happening now. I'll, I'll mention this now. I've got five minutes, and then we'll come back to it on Wednesday. All of this stuff we did for R and S cannot be forgotten, because this is where we use it. And this is where we use some of those clues to help out work out what happened. So alpha D is important. You must spend some time between now and Wednesday worrying about alpha D. Recognize what it is, what it's used for. If alpha D is zero, what does that tell you? Racemic mixture. What else could it be? What other situations had an alpha D of zero? A chiral molecule, no chirality whatsoever. Another one. Any, any more? Meso gave a zero because it's an internal racemic mixture. So you know what zero means. And now what we'll start to do is worry about what the numbers mean. What do the numbers tell you? Well, look at this slide. In this molecule, in this starter material, you have pure. S. It isn't a mixture. It's been made. It's been purified. It is pure S and nothing else. And if you do an SN2 reaction on this, you're going to end up with what we call an inversion, where the stereo center seems to flip. And you'll see this is a consequence of the mechanism. Now, we've got to be careful here. If this has an alpha D of some number, you will not be able to tell me what that number is. The only number you'll be able to tell me is zero the reasons that become apparent on Wednesday. But this has a number, a value that isn't zero. And over here, alpha D, any ideas? Say again? No, no, no. It's, an, it's a decent idea, but are they, are they related? Are they enantiomers? No, they're different molecules, aren't they? So what should we have on the right-hand side? Why? Why not? OK? They will be measurable numbers. And when we put the SN1 up on Wednesday and start talking about it in more detail, you'll see the difference here. The fact that you start out with a measurable alpha D is because this is chiral. And the fact that you get an alpha D over here, a value that isn't zero, tells you that this is chiral. So that tells you a lot about the mechanism. Plus, if you want to work out the, the you know, is it unimolecular or bimolecular, you just do the experiment. You add more nucleophile. Does it go faster? Yes, it does. So it's dependent on the nucleophile. You add more substrate. Does it go faster? Yes, it does. So the slow step, in this case only one step, is dependent on both. That's why it's a biomolecular process. But we're going to see now that the approach of this thing is absolutely pre-organized. Okay? You're not going to be attacking from the front. You're going to be attacking from the back. The simple answer is that's where the space is. Think about what needs to happen here. I'm attacking a carbon that quite happily was existing with eight electrons. All my bonding orbitals are full. So I bring an extra pair of electrons in. Where are they going to go? Antibonding, that's why it gets unstable. So that antibonding is at the back. The bonding piece is at the front, the antibonds at the back. I need to bring this in from that direction to satisfy that. That's where you're going to deposit the electrons. You're docking the nuclear file into the antibonding orbital. And that causes this to happen. So we're going to use this word, stereospecificity. Complicated one. So the nature of the starter material dictates the nature of the product. In this case, the stereochemical nature of what you start with dictates the stereochemical nature of what you get. That's stereospecificity. If this is the, and you've got to be very careful here, 
In this example, it's a coincidence. S seems to turn into R. That shows you that something's changed, right? You've got the opposite name, R, S to R. But they're not related as molecules. These, this is not the same molecule as this, so they're not in antimers. S turns into R. But that's all based on a scheme that people came up with to name these things. I could imagine bringing in some nuclear file that isn't number one over here. And you can change the priority order. So as you practice these things, which you obviously must, S can become S. R can become R if you swap the priority order around. In my molecule on the left, BR is number one, and I'm swapping it for number one. There's no change in the priority order. All you're doing is changing the stereochemistry. That's why S went to R. But be very careful. I'll mention this again on Wednesday. You don't always have that. So with that in mind, we've got now the first example of stereochemistry in an organic reaction in which the nucleophile has to come from the back of this thing and kick out from the front. On my last slide, yeah, I'll do that. It's because that's where the opening is. That's where the orbital is that you have to attack. Now, let's think about this logically. We have a tetrahedral carbon on the left. I'm bringing in electron density from this direction. What's going to happen to these bonds? They're going to get out the way. They're going to get out the way, right? Repulsion. Negative, electrons, repel. They're going to get out of the way. So this slide here, which is where I'll start on Wednesday, is showing you why we have to go from the back. We have to go from the back because that's the place we're going to deposit the electron density, into this orbital right here. This is where we go. And it's highlighted by this, which isn't going to work today, is it? I'll get it for Wednesday. But it shows the nuclear file coming in from this direction and this thing breaking off. So work to do, get it done, and we'll be into eight fairly soon.